Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're back for another 82-game season, and by the time everyone hears this, we'll be on the verge of, I guess, twas the night before opening night for the Flames. Uh, the Calgary Flames kick off their season on the 16th in Edmonton, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. We did it last week, but we'll say it again, we're kicking off our 10th season. And uh, Matt, we got yeah, a lot to talk about tonight. it's exciting that the new hockey season is up, and you know fans are back in the buildings, and life is starting to... And a season that, even besides the fans, feels more normal. We're going to play 82 games. We're going to cross the borders. Yeah, it feels like hockey again instead of Bizarro Land, where, you know, Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa are in our division for some reason. It'll be it'll be an interesting season, and of course, the first season of the Seattle Kraken. We should probably call out uh, congratulations to Mark Giordano for being named the first captain of their organization. Yep, and... Uh... Hopefully, he has a very successful season as the captain of the Kraken as they move forward, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how they do this year. I don't expect them to do what Vegas did, though. No, I don't think anyone will do that again. But enough Seattle talk. Um, we're not going to go through every one of the exhibition games since we talked last, but Matt, let's just sum it up. Some overall thoughts on the, uh, the last four exhibition games since last time we talked. Well, I thought that the Flames had a few good young players uh, show some additional push to actually making the opening day roster. Uh, Glenn Gaudin actually did make the uh, opening day roster. Uh, But also uh, Walker Dewar and uh, Oliver Shillington, as well as uh, Daniel Vladar, all played rather well during the preseason. And all those guys that you just mentioned, but Walker Dewar, have uh, are on the really the opening day roster in, in some form. They probably won't all be playing, but they're at least on the roster. And really, Walker Dewar not making that doesn't surprise me. We'll talk about opening day rosters in a bit here, but a um, guy who you know probably needs some American League seasoning. It's not very often you go from being a walk on to get an NHL job. Yeah, and the Flames did uh, sign him last season, but. Uh... It's one of those things that uh, he played well enough and very reminiscent of a player uh, that I liked previously, which was Garnett Hathaway. And so I'm hopeful that he has a successful start to the season in Stockton and can fight his way back up here. And for those that don't know, Walker Dewar was signed, as Matt said, as a free agent. He's from... uh... Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He's been playing for the Minnesota State University in the NCAA. And last year, I think, played five games at the Heat, if I remember correctly. So got a little bit of a taste of the pros, and uh, that's probably where it'll be again. Mm-hmm. So I, I would agree with you about those young players. I think, you know, we didn't we didn't see a lot new from the veterans, but we didn't have to. I guess, you know, maybe we should have played Coleman less because he got himself suspended. Um, but, you know, I think we saw the vets look like they were ready to go. I guess that's the best way to say it. And as you said, guys that were fighting for a spot, I think, showed that, okay, maybe they can be here. And I would say with Daniel Vladar, um, maybe I'm not as worried as I was last week when we talked about the goaltending here in Calgary. Yeah, and I think he played a lot. And the coaching staff and general manager even mentioned that uh, he, they played him a lot more than they normally would just because of the fact that he didn't have a lot of ice time last year. And, you know, I'm expecting that they're hoping him to be more of a 1B and, like, play on a regular basis instead of, you know, like the 10-15 game per season guy. And so to get him a lot of reps early to get him going so that way when the puck drops in the regular season, you have a guy that's actually ready to go instead of, trying to figure it out and, you know, might have some really bad games to start. I think you're probably right. Any other uh, overall thoughts on the preseason? Should we jump ahead to looking at the season? Oh, it's just uh, encouraging to see that for once, it seemed that the Flames as a whole seemed more prepared for the season in training camp. Like, usually, like, at... A lot of players are up and down, and it's like uh, you're like say like uh, Backlund a couple years ago was looking pretty 
awful at one preseason and it's like hoping that he'll pick it up by the time the season starts. I think this year basically everybody looked ready to go and it was just more of a needing the lineup to actually be going. And, and I think maybe this year more than other years, Matt, that these guys realize they've got, I don't want to say something to prove, but they realize that they underperformed and they need to be ready to go right away. Well, exactly. Like last year, the Flames really, with the Flames division, should have been one of the top two teams. And they didn't even make the playoffs. And that basically signifies that, hey, you guys, your effort level sucks. And, you know, like, things are bad. And it's no wonder that, like, basically every player that the Flames acquired this offseason are high-effort players. And, you know, hopefully to drag everybody else that might be lackadaisical at times, get that, you know, kick them in the pants to get them going too. Because, you know, like, it's just not acceptable at the NHL level to be as passive as the Flames have been over the last few years. And I think some of this comes down to, and we won't talk about it now, but I think some of this comes down to the fact that they now have an identity, which we'll get to mm-hmm. after we look at this roster. Yeah, I agree. Um, but before we get there, let's talk about some of the new hires. The Calgary Flames announced uh, today that they made a whole bunch of new hires in the hockey ops department. Four brand new hires, as well as five individuals who are already part of the organization, got new roles. Three of these individuals have ties to uh, Brad Living. So if we take a look, four scouts, one amateur and three, or sorry, one pro, three amateurs. Derek Clancy is a new pro scout with the team. He joins the club after serving a variety of roles with the Pittsburgh Penguins since 07. Most recently, the director of pro personnel. Before scouting, he also coached in minor pro and played for about a decade professionally, including with Flames GM Brad for living in 94 95 on the Columbus Chill. And uh, Clancy has his name on the Pittsburgh Penguin Stanley Cup twice. He has three rings, didn't get his name engraved one of the times that he got a ring. So I, I think like we talked about earlier with players, uh, we just want guys around this team, hockey-wise, who have a ring. And a guy who's a pro scout and knows how to scout for a team with a cup is a great thing. Yeah, exactly. And... <sighs> Like, how would you say, sometimes teams, like, especially if they're having difficulties like the Flames have been, you need to have players and coaches that have actually been there and know, like, when games are tough, how to actually respond properly. And, like, that was part of the reason why, like, I was not particularly upset to see Mark Giordano move on. Uh, No slight to him, but, like, he didn't have any actual experience with, being successful in the postseason and you know i and it looks like milan lucic is going to be the captain just based on practices because he's been leading the drills but um it's one of those things that you need like a coach that knows how to win daryl's one of the best and this case a scout who knows how to pick guys that are going to help you win exactly and it's one of those like you need that philosophy of you know, where you actually care about losing and, you know, you you hate that and, you know, want to do everything not to lose. And, you know, some players have that in them, some players don't, and you need other people like the this new scout to see which of those and, like, help to identify that. David Ackerblom joins the club. He was uh, as the Swedish amateur scout. He was previously coaching in the in the Swedish league. Jason Taylor joins the club as a Western Canadian amateur scout. He's a longtime player agent with Newport Sports and previously played in the league, uh, including a season again with Trilliving in Columbus. Trevor Hansen joins the club as the New England amateur scout. He previously had that role with the Canadians and Arizona, where he overlapped Trilliving's last few seasons as AGM there. He mm-hmm. also has previously worked as a scout with St. John's in the QMJHL. Departing from the organization, this one surprised me, Ron Sutter. His brother's back, but he's out of here. Uh, head, head European scout Hakan Lube, who is retired. Uh, European scout Bobby Haglin and Western Canadian scout Reed Jackson, as well as Quebec New England scout Eric Soltes are all leaving. And five people that were previously in the organization part-time have been, had their roles solidified. Um, former 
assistant coach Ray Edwards. If you remember, he became an assistant coach. What was it? It was when Bill Peters left. So he's going back to his old job as director of player development. And Marty Jelena won't be a regular uh, coach. He'll become a development coach. Previous part-time Flame staffers, Danielle Fujita, their skating coach, and Connor Rankin, their video analysis, and uh, Michael Sharon, their quant- quantitative analyst, have all been upgraded from part-time to full-time. So that was a mouthful. We won't break a lot of those down, but a bunch of new faces and guys that are, uh, or we say people, um, that are in the organization now that uh, weren't before. So along with some new names in hockey ops, we've also now got a few new names on the roster. The Flames have announced their opening day roster for this year. I'll go through this roster. Matt, I don't think we probably need to comment on these guys. I think we know all of them, but I will ask you at the end, uh, any surprises on this roster? So the forwards for this team are Michael Backlund, Johnny Goudreau, Brad Richardson, who will start the season on IR, Milan Lucic, Tyler Pitlick, who is uh, also starting on IR, I believe, Matthew Kachuk, Blake Coleman, Trevor Lewis, Sean Monahan, Brett Ritchie, Elias Lindholm, Dylan Dubé, Glenn Godin, and Andrew Mangiapane. The defensemen are Rasmus Anderson, Yusuf Valamaki, Chris Tanev, Nik- Nikita Zadorov, Michael Stone, Eric Goodbranson, Noah Hannafin, Oliver Shillington, and the goaltenders obviously are uh, Markstrom and Jacob Markstrom and Dan Vladder. Any names on those surprise you to see on the opening day roster? Uh, not really. Like even uh, Glenn Godin, who's probably the most surprising name, uh, he played rather effectively during the preseason and was very good at the faceoff circle, so. I would expect him to be the fourth line center and the prime penalty killer while he's uh, in the lineup. And I think that like once everybody's healthy and not suspended, then uh, everything will be back well, to normal. I was going to ask, how long do you think Glenn will last in Calgary? Uh, probably a week or so. I think this is a guy you don't keep here to ride the pine. This is a guy if you're not playing him, he's got to go Stockton. Yeah, exactly. So he earned that shot to be here. Um, And, you know, I think he will probably be the guy that gets the most forward call-ups this year if we're we're short a guy. Yeah. I've heard some people online talking about surprise that Brett Ritchie's on this lineup. I mean, he's a very Daryl Sutter player. And I actually dug into his stats because I didn't know a lot of this guy. But, I mean, he's had seasons where he played 78 games, 71 games, 53 games. So... I would say a guy that can be a regular NHL or probably your fourth line, but a a solid enough NHL player. Yeah, he's your physical fourth line guy who can fight a bit and engage physically. Like, that's his game. That's what Daryl would want from him. So I would expect him to play most of the games, frankly, just because of that. And I think more complete than, I mean, I don't want to call him a tweener, but more complete than some of the tweeners we've seen, like our buddy Robinson and guys like that oh, over for the sure. last couple of years. Well, that that was why when he came aboard last year that he basically stayed on the lineup from that point forward. Um, and then the uh, the other thing, if we take a look at the Flames back end, they've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight defensemen. Do you think they're going to carry eight defensemen for the majority of the season? Probably. Uh, like, the only guy that I could see being sent down is Stone. Because I think Shillington played his way where, like, if the Flames exposed him on waivers, that he would not be a Flame. If, uh, if Shillington gets... Um, why don't we just do that last part yeah, again? I'll start from Sh- I'll working. start from Shillington. Sure. Uh, with Shillington's play during the preseason, uh, he pretty much played himself into a role where if the Flames expose him on waivers, that some team will look at him and probably claim him because there are, are a lot of teams that need depth defensemen, and you know he played well enough that he turned some heads. And you know I think that Shillington will probably play most of the season here. I think that they're trying to iron out some issues with his. A few defensive lapses, but, you know, the that's basically been the problem with him right from the get-go anyway. I feel like Shillington's definitely going to stay here. I think you're right. He would probably get claimed at this point, but I I think that he's probably destined to be the number seven this year, and I think he's got to beat good Branson to be the number six. Yeah. Um, so we'll see if that happens or not. I think you could be right. I think Mike Stone is probably the guy to send down if we need to. 
Um, but I don't know. It just like they like his energy. They like him as a leader here. I don't know if the Flames would do that. They seem to like him, but I I just can't see this team carrying eight defensemen. The only reason I guess I could is because it's hard to get a guy up from Stockton if there's any sort of quarantine. So you might carry them because of that. But I think in that case, Stone is your eight, and Shillington's probably your seven to start. The season. Yeah, and you know the, the Flames also could do what they did in practice yesterday, which is use Shillington as a forward. No, don't uh, don't give him any ideas. Well, 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 well they did so. yesterday. So, well, they were also short bodies. Yeah, still, <laughs> I I had to throw um, that in. You, you know, I had to. Yeah, I know. When I saw that on a get tweeted by Steinberg, I'm like, well, Matt's gonna have something to say about yeah. this one. <laughs> Um, but I think that I think they're probably carrying eight guys just because it's going to be tougher to get a guy out from the farm. Yeah. And you know what? I hate to say it. I think that with a Daryl Sutter style play and the Daryl Sutter style team, I think we're going to have more blue line injuries than we usually do. Yeah, so I think I agree. carrying eight guys will probably be useful. Yeah. Then uh, uh, just to add on to that, like I have liked what I've seen from both Nikita Zadorov and Erica Branson. Uh, in the preseason, it's nice to have some physical defensemen. And yeah, they're prone to some defensive lapses. But you also need to make life difficult on the other team. Mm-hmm. And make them worried about going into those danger areas. And, you know, because like, if you know that Zadorov's going to come and clock you, if you're in that area, you know, you're going to be a little reticent to do so. And it, those little things, you know, like, yeah, he does make some mistakes. Same with Good Branson. But I think that the positives of that physicality will outweigh the negatives from time to time. As much as you're saying Good Branson makes some mistakes, I mean, let's be honest, he's a number six on this team. Show me a number six that doesn't make mistakes. Yeah, pretty much. Like, you know. He's an adequate... That's why, that's why you're number six. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, when's the last time you've heard of a number six who's, like, an awesome player? Unless you're a Stanley Cup team and you, you're you just stacked. And I think that this team would really like Zadorov. If we think of Zadorov as being our second pair and Valley as being our third pair, I think this team would like to flip-flop those guys, but I think that um, it's not time yet. Yeah, and I think that... But I could see by the end of the year the Zadorov good Branson pairing being sort of our blues our bruise brothers, our next iteration of Fanuf and Regeer. Yeah. Well, exactly. And like realistically, since Regeer left, other than the couple of years that Derek England was here, the Flames really haven't had a physical presence on the blue line. And No. You know, it's one of the things that frankly has been lacking a lot because teams don't have to worry about going and skating to the front of the net because they know the defensemen aren't going to hit them or make their life miserable. And, you know, those two, they will make your life miserable. So it's it's a small dynamic, but especially like when you get to the postseason, we saw how impactful Derek England was against the Canucks. And, you know, even to a lesser extent against the Ducks in the second round. And, you know, those kinds of things matter when the games matter more. Well, I think what you were saying there, Matt, is interesting because I think for the first time, looking at this team in the preseason and knowing kind of, you know, who our coach is, finally a coach that we know what to expect, uh, we have an identity. This team is already and will continue to be that tight-checking, defensive-oriented, hard team to play against. I think goals are going to be tough to come by for this team, but I think that they're also going to be they're going to be earned against us, and you're really going to have to earn those goals. Yeah, and, you know, how would you say, I don't mind losing games if you've made the other team earn the hell out of it. It's when you're playing poorly. The, the, or you're playing 40, what, this team's reputation's 40 minutes and they're done. Exactly. And it's those kinds of games where it just infuriates you because it's like, uh, where's the effort, guys? You know, but you know this team is going to make everybody earn every inch on the ice and that the opponents are going to have to keep their heads up at all times because if it's not the defenseman hitting you, the Flames have like four or five good forwards that can also deal a lot of punishment. 
you know, like it's going to be one of those where all the opponents now are going to have to realize that they're going to have to keep their heads up when they're in Calgary, and that's going to throw their game off. And that's successful for us because, like, when we've seen other teams that have a set identity, like Chicago, like Boston, in the past, like, they just come and play their game. And, you know, you have to beat them. And Calgary hasn't really dictated the play since probably nearly 20 years ago. And I feel like, you know, there's going to be some guys that are going to need to adjust to this. I think some of our star players who are maybe used to sort of playing their own game, or we've had some coaches that have sort of been had a reputation as players' coaches, quote-unquote, um, and, you know, guys that are maybe tailoring to what a star player wants or how they want to play. So I can see some growing pains, but I feel like, now everybody knows what's expected. You know what you got to do. You know what you got to do to not ride the pine. Go out and do that. Yeah, and frankly, like, I know some people have been concerned about Gaudreau, frankly, uh, in Daryl's system. Gaudreau's going to be perfectly fine. Uh, and frankly, yeah. this system actually suits his style more because it's more of a high-tempo thing. And where Johnny, over the last few years, has had to slow down to keep up with Monaghan. Uh, you know, and I think that with him being more able to just fly, I think that will benefit him a lot more. And Daryl's also a smart enough coach that he's going to know how to adapt things to the star players. Yeah, it, it's one of those where it's not necessarily special treatment. It's about maximizing at the situations for those players to be successful doing what they do. I would agree with that. When I look at this lineup on paper, and we talked about this last week, it still feels like there's some holes, but when I look at sort of the three parts of it, the forwards, the defense, and the goalies, I still feel like the defense is the part that maybe on paper doesn't look as strong as the others. Do you think in a Daryl Sutter system, we're going to get more out of this defensive, let's call it a, a, an eight-some? I don't know, is that a word? An eight-some? than <laughs> Our defensive octet, that, that sounds like some sort of like barbershop singing. Exactly. Word. Defense, 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 defense. <laughs> um, our, 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 defen our defensive octet, um, do you think we'll get more out of them than maybe they look like we will on yeah. paper? Yeah, and I think that, uh, especially in Daryl's system, the forwards play defense more. And, like, they're back, and they're, the, the gap control is significantly better. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, like, I've been frustrated with is that uh, the team tends to fly the zone a little too much. And with this type of system that Daryl normally, it's a shot suppression system. It's clogging up the front of the net. It's preventing everything, uh, you know, because if you're preventing shots, then you don't have to worry about them going in. So, you know, and it's one of those things that I think that because of the formula of the system, it'll make the defensemen look a little better than perhaps they are. I agree. But it also, I think, with not having Giordano as the the guy, I think it's uh, one of those where Daryl can say to Anderson, Hannafin, Valimaki, Shillington, hey, we have a number one spot available. Um want it you know if you you earn it go for it and mm -hmm. you know i think that motivation especially for wanting a better paycheck down the don't, road don't tell good branson that <laughs> <laughs> oh god could you imagine him playing 25 minutes a night against mcdavid <laughs> good branson and stone are top pairing yay first overall pick shane wright <laughs> But yeah, no, it's one of those things that uh, I think that having so many good young defensemen and like actual legit opportunities for them to earn those roles, I think will help get as much out of them. Because especially because like if you're looking at like say Rasmus Anderson, if he becomes a first pairing guy, like instead of getting being a four million dollar defenseman, he's like six or seven million dollar defenseman. You know, and anybody is going to be motivated to wanting to earn that extra few million dollars a season. So, 
you know, it, it, it's one of those things that, like, there is a motivating factor there, and hopefully some of those guys actually seize the, that opportunity. I think the other thing we're going to see a lot of, and you've heard me complain about this a lot in our game recaps, is the Flames have this tendency in the offensive zone to have the forwards go deep, and then they pass it out and the defensemen aren't ready, and then we got to come all the way back out and all the way back in. And I feel like we've already seen it a little bit under Daryl this season, where, like you said, the forwards have more defensive responsibility, and we're seeing one winger sort of floating around the hash mark area, and their job is to sort of play that rover role almost, to keep the keep the puck in the offensive zone and away from the blue. Yeah, line. and it's one of those things that it's a minor detail, but it, it's those kinds of things that help to keep the puck in the offensive zone, keep the pressure on, you know, keep the focus on, you know, the generating the offense, so that way you can switch out lines and just keep that momentum going. And it, sometimes being more defensively responsible means that you just control the puck more. And if you're doing that, especially with the amount of talent the Flames have on the roster, that that will result in longer stretches of time where the Flames are steamrolling the opposition and more goals. So Matt, I think last year was a disappointing year by all standards. Yeah. I mean, can you think of a can you think of a standard that wasn't disappointing last year? Um, not really. Um, frankly, that, I guess that maybe was, the the hiring of Sutter was the non disappointing part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like uh, that was pretty much one of the most embarrassing seasons as a Flames fan that that I can recall. Like it, for a team that should have been a top tier team in that division to miss out like it, it just yeah like that's not acceptable in any way shape or form so i guess what do we need to see from this team overall do you think to see progress i mean it's easy to say everyone's got to play better but to me i think we need to see and i pinpointed these i think we need hannafin to play as though he's a number one d-man he's the guy on our team that has had that number one d-man experience i think can step back into that and Tanev's the right partner. I think we need Monahan to bounce back, but not to bounce back as a number one center. I think he's been overplayed there, but I think we need Monahan to bounce back into a non-injured form and solidify himself as a solid number two. And I think a number two that's less of a playmaker and more of a, a goal. I'll just go through these, and then we can break them down while I'm thinking about them. Um, less of a playmaker, more of a goal scorer. I think Markstrom needs to bounce back he played injured a lot of last year and i think mon japani and dubay need to keep developing yeah and frankly like if you look at the team like once blake coleman's back from his suspension like he'll probably be playing in the top six with mon japani and du uh monahan but uh you're looking at this team where like the first power play unit you're likely going to see hannafin plus Gaudreau, monahan kachuk and lindholm Mm -hmm. And so, like, it's not like Monahan being banished to the second line means that he's not going to get opportunities. Um, especially, like, even when he was the first line center, frankly, he was, like, getting most of his points on the power play anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, that won't diminish. And, and I don't think him being a second liner is banishing him. I think it actually helps to make us a deeper team. Yeah, and, like, he's not particularly good defensively. And no, like what? But if you pair him up with if you pair him up with Monge and Coleman, I think that you know they can help to hide some of those weaknesses. Yeah, well, you see, and the, that's the thing. Like with Monahan, like if he is your number one, like you're going up against the other team's number one, and generally the Flames would be on the losing end of that particular matchup just because mm -hmm. of generally the other guys are more complete. And now with Monahan being a second line center, his defensive game is less of a big deal because he'll be matched up more on the like second tier guys and second tier defensemen. And you know, it'll make his day a little bit easier. And I think that Daryl will help him to learn how to play a defensive game better. And I think he might be one of the more improved players by the end of the season. But, I um, 
Yeah, and uh, having two quicker guys like Coleman and Manjapane on his line will help, uh, especially like if there are uh, transitions the other way. Those two guys are a lot faster to get back and you know allow him to get there. You know, and do you, do you think we're gonna see Johnny and Monty broken up for the for, for the majority of the season for the first Probably. time? Probably, which that's a good thing. I think. Yeah, I think your first line is probably 13, 28, 19, and your second line is uh, Coleman, Monahan, and Monjapani. So I think you'll definitely see some play time with Goudreau Monahan, but I think we've we've done that. We know what's there, and I don't think it was what we needed. Yeah, and especially sometimes, like say like the first line's not clicking on a certain night, you can easily flip Coleman on the line and Goudreau down to with Monahan. And, you know, like, you know the chemistry is there. They know how to work with each other. It, it's sort of like with Chicago, how they separated Kane from Taze. And, you know, it, it worked for a while. And, you know, but yet whenever they needed to, they could easily reunite them. And I think that that's what you'll end up seeing is, like, if, especially if the first line's not going on a certain night to shake it up, you, you have that option. I'm also curious to see if Sean Monahan will remain the number two center all year or if Michael Backlund could take that spot. And I can totally see a, a scenario where maybe Monahan gets hurt again or Monahan gets in a funk and Backlund's looking really good and you flop those two for a little bit. Yeah, could see that too. Yeah. You know, and I don't know I like a Monahan Lewis Lucic line, but there's enough guys there you could play around with. But I think. We've seen in the past whenever Backlund got relegated to third line, and he seemed to be upset about it. Like, if you watch the sort of the post-game media and whatnot, he's usually quite upset, it seems, when he's been sort of a third line guy in the past, when it was Monaghan one and him two. So I think he's going to be a guy that's really gunning to get into the top six. Yep, and that level of competition in the team is a good thing. And, you know, if you earn it, good. If you don't, oh well. Do you think that we that we see Elias Lindholm as a center yes. all year? And Matthew Kachuk is starting right wing. Do you think that's where the team's going to use him long yeah. term? Do you think he's kind of our right wing solution yeah. now? Well, even like when he was drafted and that, and like after, I, I, I repeatedly suggested uh, throwing him on the right side with Gaudreau on the left. So um, him being over there, how would you say it? Just as an, a tangent. Like, I've never really understood why you would not want the guys that are your good shooters like Kachuk that are on the wing to be on their offhand. It, because when they're sh they've are they got the puck on the right side, their stick's facing the center part of the ice, so they have a lot more to shoot at. And, like, that's a lot more advantageous to you than, you know, the stick facing the boards, because, like, you don't really have a lot to shoot at. Because, yeah. like, I, I used to play goal uh, when I was younger, and, like, any time I'd see that, like, you, you can kind of cheat as a goalie because you know that, like, he's only got one lane to actually shoot at you, and, you know, you can pretty much cover that whole section, and he, he has to pass it if or, you know, do something interesting mm -hmm. to create a space for himself, and... You know, that with Kachuk being on the right side, I think that'll be a really good thing, especially with his level of shot. Yeah, I don't disagree on that. Uh, while well, we're talking about Kachuk, if we look around the league at top lines in the league and top lines of teams that expect to be good teams, do you think that Goudreau, Lindholm, and Kachuk stacks up as a top line for a, a contending team this yep. year? I think that's a top 10 t line in the league. And when I look at this lineup as a whole, there's really nastiness on, or what I'd call sort of your Daryl Sutter, Western Canadian player on every line except for that second one. I mean, Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk. I think Kachuk get to play Kachuk's game again, which I think hindered him last year. I think the third line, you got Lucic and Lewis. They got that sandpaper. The last line, you'll have Richie. He's got that sandpaper. Are you worried that in the current lineups, um, Dubé... Well, let's even say Coleman, Monjapani, and Monahan. That there's not that real sandpaper. Well, if there. Coleman's on that line, Coleman is definitely that guy. Like he's very much in that 
He's he's in that yeah. grinder ish, but can score. He's a good two way. Yeah, I guess you're probably right. Yeah, and like if you're putting Dubé on the third line, you can have that agitator guy on the right side, and you know, like there's enough where you can spread the wealth. And basically, like this team is going to have enough quality players who are also physical. Like Milan Lucic is a quality player who can also, you know, put you through the boards. And having guys like that through the lineup and on the defense core, that will make sure to keep that in the minds of the opposition. And anytime you can distract the other team from their game even a little bit and have them thinking about things that aren't on their game sheet, <laughs> that that's an advantageous thing for you. And because you can just do your thing and you don't have to worry so much about what they're doing. And I think also anytime that you can, um, anytime that you can sort of make a guy not want to play here. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing this year is you're going to see guys just not want to come here and not want to deal with the flames. Well, look at Edmonton, uh, when, uh, Hemsky was playing it. I'd rather yeah. not. And, you know, he would come up against Regeer all the time and Regeer would make him, you know, enjoy his time in Calgary <laughs> and you know and Hemsky ha virtually did not score a goal or get an assist when he was playing against the Flames yet he would be a top line forward against everybody else and there are certain players where that level of physical intimidation does work and anytime that you can help to neutralize anybody on the opposition even if it's just for that game that's a great thing for you because it's one last thing you have to worry about no i think you're totally right on that um matt anything else about this lineup you want to talk about or do you want to get to our season predictions um how would you say this team it, it, to me is lesser on paper than necessarily than in the past couple of years but i think is more likely to actualize what's on the paper whereas you know like in the past years like I, i've been very optimistic and like well the flames based on their talent level should be doing x i went back and looked at our season predictions how many years of our nine so far do you think you predicted a stanley cup uh, appearance for this team at least four seven yeah well well, they, how would you say, it? they have the talent. That's where, like, I always gauge it off of talent, and, but they didn't. I think you're right, though. These guys look worse on paper this year. Yeah, but it's part of the that whole attitude and identity, and the Flames really haven't had an identity since 2004, really. And now this team, they're a skilled team that will also bloody your nose and you know that is a successful combination and has been in the past and daryl's not going to accept laziness from anybody so you know you know that this team is going to be going every time i feel like the the last time the flames had a year where they maybe got more out of a, a ragtag group was the Bob Hartley era. And we even saw guys like Josh Juris, you know, overperforming. I think that you could see that this year with Daryl Sutter, where you might see guys that shouldn't be performing as well as they are performing really well under Daryl Sutter. And I don't know if it'll be more than one year, but I think you're right. We might be able to get more out of this team than we're expecting. Yeah. I agree. And I, I also think part of that's going to be helped because – um, really, I mean, let's be honest. I think part of that will be help because we have a, a bad division. Oh, yeah. Year. Like, our division, frankly, is trash. Like, you have the three of the five worst teams in the NHL last year with L.A., Anaheim, and San Jose, and an expansion team, and Vancouver and Edmonton. Like, really, you should make the playoffs this year just by default. But, you know, uh, we said that about last year. <laughs> And they found a way. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah, no, frankly, the Flames, they should be right there with Vegas, you know, going toe-to-toe -to -toe for most of the year. 
especially because of the weakness of our division, like we should be winning most of the games against our divisional opponents. Just, I would agree. I'll tell you right now, my prediction for this division is Vegas and the three Canadian teams. Yep, I agree. Well, let's, uh, we've made a prediction already with that. Let's jump into the prediction game. For those that are maybe new to listening, we do a couple prediction games every year. We do weekly predictions and we do season predictions. So we got a lot of predictions to make tonight. Matt, I hope you got your crystal ball ready. Um, we're going to talk about season predictions. These are predictions for the whole year, things that we're, we're, we think might happen for the Flames this year or things that we want to talk about maybe happening um, for the year. And we will look back on these at the midpoint and then at the end to see how we're yeah. doing. So, Matt, I'll jump right into this. Who do you think? Which player do you think the Flames season most hinges on? Who do you think, if they have a bad season, this team could fall apart because of? Markstrom. Yeah. Markstrom? I'm gonna. I think. I think you're right, but I'm gonna say Kachuk. I think. Um, I think that Kachuk is sort of the epitome of the new the new group that they're trying to put in here, the new environment they're trying to put in. And I think he's also the, they're looking at him as the player of the future. And I think if he has a season like he does last year, I don't know that anyone's going to have a good year. I think this is a, this is a system set up for Matthew Kachuk and he, he's got to do. Yeah. Well. And frankly, like if the flames struggle and like, as you said, then you're going to see this team quickly go into rebuild mode and like transition away from the Monaghan, Kachuk, and Gaudreau types and, you know, recycle and carry on with a different group of people. Because, you know, like, if it, with and, this being set up in a way, as you said, tailor-made for Kachuk, if you can't actually do it when it's working specifically for you, then you shouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, like, and we should go with something else. And yet he and Johnny are in a contract year, so you know they're going to have stunning years. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the good thing. (laughs) All right, I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm asking in two different ways. Who needs to have a breakout season? Uh, That would be Andrew Mangiapane. Who will have a breakout season? Andrew Mangiapane. I believe in the bread. And what... I mean, he's had, I would say, breakout seasons for him every year. What would another breakout season for him look like? 30 goals. And I think I okay. think he actually has that in him. I think that um, World Championships thing last year. I think he's finally putting all of the components together, and I think that you'll start to see him being more of a dynamic offensive forward, and you know, start generating offense by himself more. And with his foot speed, and if he has good line mates, which he should. I could see a lot of opportunities for the bread man. I'm going to give two other oppor- two answers here for who needs to have a good season. I talked about him earlier. I think uh, Sean Monahan coming off injuries. Now he's healthy in sort of a new role as a number two. I think he needs to have a good season. Who will have a good season? I think Noah Hannafin. I think Hannafin's finally going to be able to show what he's got as a a young number one. Yeah, I can agree with that. That would that would and have been my to see him breaking out. Yeah, last that year. would have been my second pick for uh actually your both your things that would have been my second on both. Okay. Yeah, I just think and I said this to you back when we acquired Hannafin, this is the guy that's the heir apparent to Geo and now it's his yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. And that's why with having four good young defensemen, you know, if not Hannafin, somebody has to take it. And, yeah. And I think it could be Anderson, but Hannafin just has that experience. Oh, I agree. One. Like, I think he's further along in his development. I agree. Entirely. On the flip side, who's going to struggle this year? When we look back at this season in, you know, maybe April or hopefully not, hopefully late June, who are going to say, wow, that guy really struggled. Michael Backlund. You think so? Why do you think backs? He was not very good last year, and I think he's on the downward trend of his career. And I think that he might struggle to keep his game at a level that we're used to. And uh, with him, it seems that like if his offensive game isn't going, his defensive game lapses. And because like when he was actually playing well last year, he was good at both ends of the ice. But when he was struggling offensively, he was a true liability out there. And 
I think you might see him start to slide backwards. I was going to say Backlund, but I had both a forward and a defense. I had them written in my little black book here of Flames stuff. This is the book I take with me when I go sit in the press box of the Dome. I keep all my Flames notes in here. I had Backlund circled as well, but I had another player, so I'll go with this guy. Um, I'm going to go with Oliver Shillington. I think he looked good in the preseason. I think Shillington has to look good this year, but I feel like Shillington is going to regress quickly to be a 7 or even an 8 on this team. I could see that. I think there's enough veteran guys that he's not going to be able to surpass, and I don't know. I think if some of his issues are going to be fixed, they would have been fixed by now. It's one of those things where like, the weaknesses in his game with being mindful of details defensively, like he, it's getting to a point where like you don't really have excuses for being that careless anymore. And yeah. He sort of, he sort of reminds me of the defensive version of Sam Bennett, where it's like, why'd you take another stupid penalty? Man? Yeah, exactly. And like, I, I I can understand. Like, I know a lot of casual fans are like, oh well, why is he in instead of Good Branson or out instead of Good Branson? But you know, you're also wanting to teach accountability to the younger player that you know, like, if you're not playing defensively at a level that's needed then you know we're going to go with somebody else and you know you have to be hard on yourself and be focused every shift and yeah well even in that vein of going with someone else i think you know last year we saw that michael stone for what he is in the roster every time he came in he was a very reliable player and i think it's going to come down to somebody's out we need a guy we know we can trust we're going to go to stone i think that shillington might get passed over i agree he, he really so does need to be, put up. He does. I, I think this is really the year that it's put up or get out of town. I don't know that he's done in the NHL, but I think maybe there's not a fit with the Flames if he can't do it this I year. I agree. And it, it'll be interesting. He's like the big question mark for me this season because like he'll either and, establish and think, himself as pretty much like a top four guy by the end of the year or he'll be kind of like, yeah, we're going elsewhere. Like... Hey, Connor Mackey, come on up. Well, and I was about to say, I think they've kept him around because he's sort of the next best that we had. But with Mackey knocking on the door, I think it's going to be, okay, Oliver, if you can't do this, Connor, you're yeah. up. And with other guys coming into the organization, you know, like uh, we finally actually mm -hmm. drafted some defensemen last year. So, you know, that's, that's always a good thing. I mean, what I'm... What I'm hoping happens is I don't think Zadorov's here next year. I think that the idea is that Valimaki develops to a number four spot and then Shillington takes the, let's call it the five, six spot and everybody sort of shuffles up one. Um, but I just, I don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah. How would you say having Zadorov is like the ultimate insurance policy? Because like if certain players... He's a one-year placeholder. It's one of those where like if the Flames are having issues with their defense, younger defensemen, like, say Valmaki and Shillington do not progress both of them, then you can bring back Zadorov for another year or two until you you have, like, the other young guys starting to, you know, because Zadorov's a perfectly fine four five six guy. So, you know, if you can keep him if need be, then why not? The next question here, who's going to pleasantly surprise us? We talked about who's maybe going to disappoint us or struggle. Um, who are we going to look back at the season and say, wow, that guy, I didn't expect that from them. They did an awesome Daniel job. Daniel Vladar. Yeah, yeah? I, I could see him cementing himself as a legitimate goalie in the NHL, pushing for upwards for a starter job down the road. I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to say Eric Goodbranson. I think Goodbranson's maybe had too much responsibility on previous teams, and I think you could see him stick around with the Flames for a couple of years in a reduced 5-6 role. I think there's a lot of fans that didn't like that signing, but I think it's veteran depth and something that we probably need on our blue line. Yep. Anytime you have a policeman out there to, you know, if you get out of line here, have some fists or, you know, enjoy your time in the boards. <laughs> You know, that's a good thing. And, you know, it's something the Flames have lacked for a while is those big physically imposing defensemen. And I between the 
And I think of the of the two of them, I'd rather keep good. If they do equal numbers, keep good Branson because he's yeah, cheaper. Yeah, I could see that. Um, let's talk about goalies. You mentioned Vladar. Will both goalies stay healthy? Probably not. Who do you think would? Who do you think is going to be the one that succumbs to the longest injury? Probably Markstrom, just due to odds. <laughs> okay. So you think that we're going to have a Vladar Warner pairing at some uh, point? Probably Vladar Wolf. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say both goalies get healthy. I think, I think that, I mean, when I'm saying they're not healthy, I'd say what for a goalie more than five games in a row, yeah. they're out. Like that's kind of your, you know, your goalie metric. I, I think both guys are going to stay healthy this year of an 82 game season. How many starts does Markstrom get? 55. The most he's had in his career. Let me just double check is I think, uh, twice he got 60 and that's when he was in Vancouver. I think that if Vladar, he, and this has always been our thing, right? If Vladar plays really well, I can see 55. But I think Daryl's always been a guy who likes one goalie. And I think Daryl might ride Markstrom a little harder than he should. So I'm going to say 65. Right. Who do you think will be the top point getter for the Flames? Well, that's easy. Number 13. Johnny yeah. Goudreau? In a contract yeah. year? Yeah. He wants his contract to start with a nine. I don't blame him. <laughs> I wish my contract started with a nine and not just nine dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I should ask for a raise this year since our tenth season. Um Yeah, I mean there's really no other option, is there? I was gonna say somebody else, but there's really no other option besides Jerry. Yeah, like could Chuck maybe but like Chucky's not gonna get Chucky might get maybe more assists, but he's not going to get more points. Yeah, it's one of those that's really kind of hard because, yeah, like unless good. And I, and I think I think Chucky and Lindholm could get equal points because they're both just as as important on that line. But Goudreau, yeah, no one's going to get more points than Goudreau. Yeah. All right, so we're going to take um, Godan out of the uh, next question. Who's the first call up? Um, that would probably be Dewar. Let's do uh, forward and defense. Is how we yeah, usually do Dewar this. and Mackey. So you're saying uh, Walker Dewar for forward and Connor Mackey for yeah. defense. I don't think there's really any like who else have we got on defense? There's really no other option. Yeah, there. it's like uh, uh, Kuznetsov maybe. Like it, it, I'd it, have to go look know, at, and like that would be a like if you got three or four injuries and like you know you've already recalled Mackey and you need more, like there's not really yeah it's bad. Yeah, like I'm trying to think who do we have? Maybe that's Kirkland, not... uh, I guess. Like yeah, like you're getting really into the weeds there. Lurby, if you, is Lurby still yeah, around? Uh, it. You're getting into the weeds, really. Like, yeah, I, I think I think you've got is Petrovic still here? No, uh, I think he went to Vancouver or Seattle or something okay. like that. I I think you're right about Mackey again. There's really no other option there. I'm not sure that Doer is the first call up though. I think they might go with one of the older guys, one of the guys who's been around longer. I feel like really, this is the year you've got to call Matthew Phillips. Yeah, I agree. But I think that it would depend on where in the lineup the player that is out is coming from. Like, if it's a top six guy, I think you might want Phillips instead. Because he could slot in a little better. Uh, whereas, like... If... See, I think, though, if it's a top six guy, you've got... To me, if it's top six, you're going to move Dubé or uh, back. Yeah, I agree. Up. But then you're uh, like, I, I'm imagining that you would uh, slot Phillips in, like, say, Dubé's spot type of thing. Does Phillips sort of feel like Shillington that this is the year he's got to do something? Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things that's really unfortunate that he's not, like, two or three inches taller because he'd probably be a star already in this league if he was a little bigger, but he's just I'm glad you said taller not bigger I was going to say that's what she said yeah. it's just one of those things that it, you know with his lack of size it, it's yeah it's going to be tough and and I I I hate to say this because I like him I think this might be his last year as 
a flame, but I think somebody else will take a flyer on him, and I can see him being involved in some sort of move at the in the. Yeah, offseason. I agree, and like I would be, like I'm hopeful that he'll make the NHL because he does have a significant amount of talent, but you know he also kind of screams AHL All Star for his career, kind of or like going to Europe and kicking some butt. Yeah, I can also see him being that guy who's like a Jamie Lundmark, who's perpetually your your tweener. Yeah. Good enough to be in the NHL, but nobody really gives him that yeah. chance. Um, who do you think? You think that we we've talked about who the first call ups will be? Do you think those guys or any call up will be able to take a full time roster spot? Do you think we'll see a guy sort of like the year that Dubé got called up and stayed up? Do you think we'll get a guy called up and stayed? Uh, up? not really. Uh, like the most likely would be Doer, I think. Uh, just because he think if... plays that good two-way physical game that, you know, like if one of them was going to stick, he's like the most viable in his role. That see, I would say, and he, I mean, he's already here, but I would say if there's that guy, it'd be Godden. I think Godden could get sent down and then called back up if there's a long-term injury and stick. But he's on the opening day roster, so he doesn't. Count. Yeah. That would have been my selection think... if it wasn't for the fact that he's already on the team. So, yeah. It's... Yeah. yeah. And I think we've got enough guys that we're not going to need that. Like, if... Let, let's just say somebody gets hurt. I think Brad Richards or, you know, Tyler Pitlick, who aren't even on the lineup right now, come in. Like, I just... It seems very clear that the Flames don't want prospects in the roster this year. And I think that they've loaded up enough veteran talent to make it so that doesn't have to Yeah, happen. and... How would you say, with like all of the veteran guys that they they sign, they're all extremely reliable players who care and give it their all, and it's better to have those guys, especially in your depth roles, with where the flames are, than having guys learning on the job. I agree, and especially if you think you're going to be a deep team, Deep teams, look at any deep team. They are veteran-laden. And I think that's the one, I, I would say, upgrade we've seen on this lineup. I think we have a lot more guys who know what they're doing and know how to do it than a lot of either tweeners like Buddy Robinson's or just a bunch of you know young pieces that don't really know what they're doing, like uh, Dominic Simone, who've been around but not of any significance. Yeah, and, or Josh Levo or, 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 <laughs> yeah. Every year has those. Who do you think would be the first flame traded? Oh, uh... First Calgary flame to get traded. We've never done well with this. I look back at all nine seasons. Every year, the guy that we think will get traded generally sticks around for two or three more yeah. years. I think the only time that we got that right was for a leak. But we also predicted for a leak two or I three know, years. I know, but hey, eventually we were right. <laughs> Practice yeah, exactly. Perfect. Um... Unless the Flames are making the Jack Eichel trade at some point, I don't really. I don't. I don't think you can make that trade. Mid I know. I don't really see there being anybody that would be traded off the roster. You no, don't think so? like, how would you say? Like, if the Flames are like in, you know, like seller mode at the trade deadline because everything's gone wrong, then probably Gaudreau. Uh, okay. But that would be a, like, if the whole season's been a huge, you know, disaster and, like, we're one of the worst teams in the league, then sure, you, you sell off your free agents. But, yeah, I don't see that happening. So it's kind of, I think the Flames would be vastly more likely to add, a, like, a 4-5 defenseman at the deadline than anything. Interesting. Okay, and that's actually one of the questions I'm going to get to is uh, about the deadline, so we'll come back to that. Um, on the Flames trade front, I have two names I put down here. Um, just give me a sec. I'm just going to mark down your answer of no roster player. All right, perfect. Sorry, Google Google is uh, not responding. Um I think that there's two possibilities. I think Oliver Shillington could be one because I think he could be the odd man out and we flip him for a pick. We gave up a lot of picks this year for sort of, you know, middle middle line roster guys and I think they might want to get one back or and I think I think this is a little 
more far-fetched but could get us more would be Michael Backlund. I think if, like you said, Bax is starting to regress, I think they might be able to see that early and move him before he regresses. But for that to happen, you would need somebody like Glenn Godden to be able to step into that number three center role. So a lot would have to happen for that to happen. Yeah. I could see it. It just, yeah, that's more of like if things are really going sideways, then, you know, that kind of situation. And, yeah. And I could also see that being a, and I don't want to say he asked for a trade, but I could see Backlund being unhappy with his role this year and maybe, you know, they move him for harmony. Yeah, I could see that too. Um, the next question is one that you just answered, but I'll ask it again. We don't need to say names of guys, but what type of player or what role do we try to fill at the deadline? Uh, well, I, I'm figuring that like Anderson, Tanev, and Hannafin will be the top three. And like if Valimaki or Shillington do not really elevate themselves to be a number four, then I think the Flames might need to go get that number four to push Zadorov into the third pairing. And, you know... That way you'd have Zadorov with Valimaki and then the new guy with Anderson. And, yeah. We've traditionally seen Tree go out and, and acquire a lot of veteran D-men, but I feel like we've already got that covered this year. So I'm going to say if we're not making that big splash, like you said, if we're going to make the big splash for, like, your number four D-man, I think... And we've said it for years, they need to either bring in a, a top six center or a top six forward, which I don't think they're going to want to pay for, or I think just veteran depth forward. So the veteran depth defenseman, I think we need the veteran depth forwards this year. And I think the more of those interchangeable Trevor Lewis, Brad Richards type guys you have, the better. Yeah, you're gonna like, be. uh, frankly, like the Flames could use a third line right winger that has some offensive skill to go with Backlund and Dubé. Because, yeah. like, Pitlick and Lewis Frank uh, and Richie, frankly, are kind of bad if, options for that role. And you'd kind of want those three on your fourth line, you know, with Lucic being, you know. Yeah. Well, so let's not say top six. Let's say middle six forwards with the yeah. Flames need. Yeah, and so, like, if the Flames can get that, you know, like, third line right winger who can chip in here and there, you know, it wouldn't be a high-cost acquisition, but just that solid... You know, adequate guy. And usually you can rent that player for fairly yeah. cheap. Uh, where do you think the Flames finish in the regular season in the Pacific Division? Number two, behind Vegas only. See, I want to believe that, but after last year, I don't know if I can put it down on paper. Like, we thought that last year, too, behind Toronto. Um, I don't know. Matt, I'm, I'm torn on this one. As a Flames fan... Number two is the right answer, but something is telling me they're going to finish behind Edmonton. Third. Yeah. And that could very well be. I'm I'm going to go third. I think it pains me to say it, that Edmonton's going to do better than us. Um, but it just, something tells me that Calgary's going to falter a little bit and look more like the team they are on paper than they should. And finish third still in the playoff spot but i think lower than edmonton above vancouver yeah. and like i don't see any of the california teams rebounding and i'm not confident that seattle has enough talent period to be a playoff team so it's one of those things that uh it'll be interesting i think calgary and edmonton will be close to each other and i think vegas will probably be ahead of us by like eight or ten points at the end of the year yeah, I think you're probably right. And I, I think it could be a close race. I think it could come down to, you know, the last couple weeks of the season between Calgary and Edmonton for yeah. two. How many regular season points do you think we get? Uh, Say 98. Okay, so remember that if it's an 82-game season and we get two points a game, that's 164 up for grabs. So you're thinking about 98. Yeah. I'm going to say 92. Again, I think we're going to finish a little bit lower, so I think we'll be higher than 90. Usually we say 100 points to get in the playoffs. Um, uh, how would I you think... say, uh, just because I my number's a little higher, I think, just because of the fact that you look at the teams in our division and the fact that we play them so often that we're probably going to get more points just due to the fact that 
Like, all those teams are bad. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, no, I can see that. I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to go 92. Uh, um, if the Flames don't make the playoffs, the GM and the coach, are they both fired? Is one of them fired? Do they both keep their jobs? What do you uh, think happens there? If the Flames miss the playoffs, then I think Trilliving has to go. And I think that you have to begin to really, like, transition away from... Goodrow, Monahan, Kachuk, and you know, go into kind of a tank at rebuild and you know, uh, basically do what the Senators did a couple years ago and just you know, players for sale. Uh, you know, pick up your players. The Flames brought in Kirk M- Muller this year as their associate coach, and I think if they don't make the playoffs, I think just to make a statement, I think Tree's got to go, and I think uh, Daryl's got to go as well. And then Kirk Muller becomes your head yeah. coach. Uh, how would you say? Uh, for me, I view that likelihood happening about a five percent chance of that happening. I I don't see <clears throat> like how would you say with Daryl throughout his career, he has never failed to get his teams to elevate themselves. And like once like he everything was clicking last year. Like, the Flames were only one win really away from making the playoffs. So, you know, it's one of those where I think if they can... Like, I I don't really foresee a situation this year where the Flames miss the playoffs. I don't either, but I think if they do, it's that time. Oh, yeah. Big change yeah, this made. is... Like, how would you say uh, in the past few years... It's been, well, you keep things and, you know, you try to see if you can make changes. Even, like, when the Colorado series happened, or Dallas, or... We mix <laughs> things up around this core as much yeah, as we can. and it's like, well, give it another year and let's see. This is the last year. Like, if you're not actually getting results from this team, you have to turf it. Um, how far do you think the Flames can go in the playoffs? Um... This team is quote unquote built for the playoffs, so it. You, I would guess that they would surprise more than anything, but you know, frankly, getting out of the first round will be the accomplishment, and anything more than that is gravy on top. So you're not going to say they're going to go to the Stanley Cup? This well, year? Uh, how would you say? I could see it with the makeup of the team because you look at the makeup of the team and frankly like these are the team types of teams that tend to do well in the playoffs and surprise like you know Nashville a few years ago and you know even LA when they won the cups they were built the exact same way so you know it, it could happen but frankly like the, this team is out of rope for you know based on talent you should it's okay you actually need to show that you can actually do it you know and yeah i think this i think this team this year maxes out at the second round i think they'll get out of the first round but i don't know they'll make it out past that i think we're we definitely have a good roster but as you and i have said we're missing pieces especially on the forward side and i don't know that I don't. I think that you know we can build on this after this year, but I think that there's definitely some changes that have to be made to go much yeah. further. Um, so I'll, should I put us both down for second yeah. round? Um, how would you say in the past few years, like I, I've felt that like if they met Vegas, that they would have lost to Vegas. I think that if they meet Vegas, I think they can actually beat Vegas this year. It's not our division I'm worried about. It's the other... I, I think Vegas is going to be a challenge, but I, I when I look at it, I think the maximum they could go is the third round because I don't think you can beat some of the other Western Western Coast yeah. teams that aren't Pacific. Yeah. Well, how do you say? I also don't view Vegas as being anywhere near as good as they were, and I think that losing Flurry is going to be a big thing for them. So, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I just I, their overall makeup. I'm just not feeling that they're quite as even like there's. I'll be honest though. I I kind of feel like you, but I don't think if if I have to predict now on the 14th of October, 
I don't think Vegas makes it out of the first round. They they sort of get swept by an underdog. Um, well, maybe not swept, but they get taken out by an underdog for the same reason they don't have their goalie. And I think Calgary has to worry about somebody else in round yeah. two. And somebody more hungry because they just took out the, the number yeah. one team. So let's say that's Vancouver. And I think we could have some struggles with Vancouver. Yeah, possibly. So I'm going to go second round. I, I'm not convinced. I They could go to the third, but I'm not convinced yeah. it's going to happen. I agree. It's one of those that, like, you know, the, how would you say, like, I, I've always been a little overly optimistic just based on, like, the level and degree of talent that, you know, like, you guys could do this. It, now it's, you have to actually show that you can figure out how to, what end of the stick is up when the time counts. And, and and I just think it's unrealistic to go from missing the playoffs to Stanley Cup no. finals with you know the the changes we've made. I think second round is the building yeah. block. Oh yeah, and it's one of those where you reevaluate you know each of the players after this season. Like if say they make it to the second round and all that, you know you reevaluate and you carry on and you know like it, it, how do you say like if they say face the Oilers in the first round and lose then I think that, like, you, you're kind of like, yeah, you guys kind of suck. And, you know, like, changes are still going to have to happen. But, yeah. On the playoff topic, who's our unexpected playoff hero? Eat bread. You think he's the unexpected yeah. guy? Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm talking, like, um, for people around the NHL who might not necessarily... Like, they would know Gaudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, Lindholm. I, okay. I don't think anybody really knows Eat Bread, so I think he would be the guy that would be like, oh, hey, this guy's really awesome. Man. I'm going to go Lucic. Yeah, I could see that, too. I think his veteran presence, and if he's, the, if he's wearing the C, I think he could be a guy that uh, could turn on in the playoffs. Do you think that uh, Daryl Sutter will be a Jack Adams nominee or a winner this year? Uh, if the Flames make the playoffs, Daryl Sutter wins the Jack Adams. If Flames make playoffs, he wins. Okay, I'm going to say uh, he's a nominee, but I don't think he will win. And I'm going to actually uh, say predict one award that will be won by the Flames. The Vesna? Yep. I think... I was about to ask that yeah, next. Yeah, I think that uh, with the Flames' defensive style and Markstrom being a good goalie anyway, uh, that, you know, it, yeah, he's going to have a monster season. And that's another reason why I predicted him to get 65 games earlier. I think that we can get him in easier games this year because of the defensive style. I don't think he's going to get shelled as much as he has in the past or get run into or things like that. Yeah, I can see that. If you have to look at this if, 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 to say one thing right now, what do the Flames have to do to be successful this year? Play their game, period. It, how do you say uh, in the past? The, That's been our answer for so many I years, I know, Matt. but in the past, they run around chasing whichever team that they're playing against and trying to ride their coattails and see how they can adapt their game to their opponent. They need to just play their game Make the other team earn every freaking inch on the the ice surface, every shift. And that's all that they need to focus on. Like, it doesn't matter which team. Like, if you're a f small finesse team, you're going to have a hard time playing against this physical grinder team. If you're a physical grinder team, you're going to have a tough time matching up the skill that the Flames have. Because most of the physical grinder teams don't have as much talent. So it's one of those things that the Flames, because of the fact that they have that versatility, but yet the identity that it's going to be, you know, you're going to, the Flames have the, the their team basically set up as a gauntlet where, you know, we can capitalize with our skill guys, but, you know, if you do get the puck, not only do you have to beat all of these really tough physical guys, but then you have to go and try and score on the six foot six guy that's actually really good, you know. And like you're gonna have to earn it. And as long as the Flames are playing in themselves, they don't really need to worry so much about what the other team's doing. And that's fair. I'm gonna say something similar. I'm gonna simplify mine and say they need to be hard to play against 
and everybody needs to buy into their role. And this is another reason why I think Backlund might be the first guy out of here. And there's going to be one or two guys that aren't going to buy into their roles under Yeah, Darryl. I agree. I want more offensive time. I don't want to do this. I don't want to, you know. So I think that I think there's going to be somebody that gets shipped out of here because they're not buying into yep. their role. And uh, and if you and if you get guys like Goudreau just want to go out and be the finesse forward, that, that, things are going to fall apart well, as well. Well, how would you say? Um, not necessarily. Like I think that in any system, really, you have space for a guy with a specialty skill. And Gaudreau is kind of an, an his own little planet by himself, where you know because he is one of the top dynamic players in the NHL, and he kind of just has to be able to have the freedom to do his own thing to an extent. Like yes, be defensively responsible and preach that, mm -hmm. but you know, like he also needs that flexibility to be able to, you know, maneuver in whatever. Because in the past, like, when he's had that flexibility to be himself, he's had those really good seasons. It's when he's trying to work in the systems more that he's kind of struggled a bit. And Yes, but I've also, I think that some years when he's been left to his own devices, for example, we'll see him playing a lot more in our end. Like, he'll have the puck in his end, and then the puck come out, and he wants to get another crack at it, so he'll go into our end and screw things up because he's not very good defensively. So I think even when I'm saying, you know, not just be finesse, don't just wait for that to come to you. You've got to either get off the ice and get someone out there yeah. and get it, or you've got to hang back and let the other guys get it to you. Like, I think something tries to do too yeah. much. I can see that, yeah. So that's the end of our season predictions. We will look back at these uh, roughly at the 41 game mark, which I just counted out. If I counted it correctly, that will be the 5th of January, 2022, where our 41st game will be the night before at Florida at 5 p.m. So we'll look back at these beginning of January. Yep. And, so and, and, and well, by the, the way, the looking at the schedule, I actually really like the makeup of this year's schedule because they're on the road, like for the first two months of the season, practically. And especially with a team like uh, having to play under Daryl, you don't need distractions. And, you know, being on the road, you're on the road, you're focusing on hockey. And I think that that will actually be a net benefit for this team where they're just spending time focused on their thing instead of, you know, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Speaking of the schedule, I just thought of one I'll put in here, and this has been an Achilles heel to Flames. We've often seen that after the bye week, this team fades out. Do you think that the two-week Olympic break, we'll call it the Olympic break right now, do you think the Olympic break is going to uh, kill their momentum? Well, um, how would you say? In the past, I would have said absolutely, because you know this team hasn't really had any mental fortitude. But I, with Daryl, I would not... I would actually expect them not to skip a damn beat. Because I don't think Daryl will accept that. <laughs> do you think let's let, do you think we're gonna have Olympic hockey? Yeah, I do. I think you're right about Daryl, but I mean they also can't practice, so Daryl would have to really beat it into them beforehand. I think if we have Olympics, we're gonna struggle because I think a lot of our top guys will be going to the Olympics and we usually see them tired after that. Um I think if there's Olympic hockey, we'll struggle. If there's not, we won't. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, I just think there's enough guys all throughout our lineup. Like, I think Backlund would be an Olympian, potentially. And, you know, when your third-line centerman's coming back tired and you don't have anyone to fill that role, you might have to start looking a little more at Pitlick and, you know, Richards and guys for a couple weeks. And that, if we're in a, if we're in a tough playoff chase, that could sink us. Well... How would you say I don't view the Olympics as being that overly strenuous? Cause like the, the I don't think it's overly strenuous, but a lot of it's the time zone stuff we've seen in the past. When they've gone to Italy and when they've gone to Japan, sure. it's the, the time zone. Like when it's been in North America, it's no big deal. But when they're you know halfway across the world, I think that's where it gets to guys is that jet lag when they come back. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and, we, and we've seen that. We saw that in Turin. We saw that, you know, after... Uh, I'm trying to think of the other games that we've had, but we've seen that when they've been on the other side of the world. They come back, and it's been tough for them to adjust. And even Jerome's talked about that when he's come back. Yeah. 
Um, and they've even said it's just a very different lineup again or a lifestyle again. You go from two weeks of sort of being bussed everywhere and taken care of to, you know, a different lifestyle. And it, and it you kind of want to break from the Olympics. They almost say they need a, a holiday from the Olympics. Yeah. Well, we'll see. It, yeah. I, I think that regardless, I think Daryl will be able to keep them on point regardless. I hope so. Matt, do you want to hear an interesting Flames fact? Sure. For the first time since 1994, there will be no black in the Flames uniforms. The Flames do not have a third jersey this year, so Blasty's not coming back. And that, we'll call it the third jersey last year, the recycled oh. home jersey from the year before, is not in our lineup. So we just have the the retro red and the retro white. Oh. So for the first time since 94, no black in the Flames jersey. And I don't know how I feel about that. I, I feel like... We've used black well, and then we haven't used black well. I feel like when black was the accent color, like on the pedestal jerseys, it worked well. I think we almost got too much black at one point, and now I think maybe we're almost going to be wanting black again in a couple of years. Yeah, I think that the perfect mix was the 0304 Red Flames jersey. For I don't like a whole black jersey, but no. I like like the black C or even yeah. know, the black accents on the pedestal where it was just kind of the accent colors. Yeah, well, like the 0304 Flames jersey where you had like the red with the black on the base. I think like that was like the perfect amount of black where it wasn't too much, but yet it was still prominent. And, you know, I think that was as like the perfect I... mix. Like it, it, after like... Frankly, the the previous edition of the Flames jerseys were, in my opinion, one of the three worst in the entire NHL. So, thankfully, those are gone. So. See, and, and I almost feel like there's too much red now. Like, I like the black helmet and pants. I'd almost like to see some future iteration where we've got, you know, red, yellow, and white for the jersey with maybe a little bit of black and then the black pants and black helmet because I think that adds some nice contrast. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that there is no third. You think in a year like this, when people are back at the dome and people are back in the building, you think you'd want to sell them something. And I'm kind of surprised there is no third jersey to buy. Yeah. Well, maybe. Like maybe I, you, I'm not an actual marketing expert, but if I got 70,000 people queuing up outside to get in and they're going to stand outside Fanatic, I'd be showing jerseys of Fanatic you don't have that you want to buy. But what do I know? I know. Well, you know, you you have the advertisement stickers for the helmets now, so, you know, you can sell those. And in the future, you'll be able to get the yearly patch that'll go on the jersey starting next year. Yeah, which is. But you're saying there's advertising stickers on the helmets. Where do you put those? Nobody wears a helmet to the games. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Put them on your hat? Sure. Or if you're like me, so, who's bald, you know, just right there you go. Just stick it on the side of your head. Yeah. <laughs> Polish up your head and stick the stick the advert. I'm going to start pitching that when we're looking for advertisers for the show. We'll stick your uh, sticker on the side of Matt's head. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. It just feels weird. This is the first time the Flames haven't had a third jersey since... Uh, what oh well I guess they didn't have one in oh seven to oh nine and then again seventeen eighteen, but they pretty much had a third jersey since ninety eight and they've had black in since ninety since ninety four so it's kind of weird to go all the way back to where we started back to two jerseys I mean how many teams just have two jerseys these days no you know no special game jerseys none like that to just two jerseys it feels kind of weird yeah. Uh it's like almost feels like we're turning into the New Jersey Devils, who basically for like forever didn't have a third jersey, you know. And yeah, it's kind of weird. Well, yeah, and I'm I'm just kind of surprised because I'm not a Blasty fan. I know you're not a huge Blasty fan, but the Blasty jersey had so much popularity last year that I'm surprised they're not keeping it. I know, like even though like that was a one year thing. Like, even if you do, like, the original Blasty and sell that, like, you know, yeah, it's kind of just a weird thing all the way around. Matt, have you seen the new NHL jerseys with the raised, embossed logos on yeah, them? Yeah, looks a lot better. What do you think? Looks better. I think it's cool. So if, if anyone's a completionist... You're going to have to get yourself another jersey. Maybe that's what they're going for. They're, they think they can sell more of those to completionists than they could third jerseys. Yeah. So, Flames, if I've uh, given you new information you didn't know here, have a third jersey because people are going to be lining up to get their vaccine checked and you can sell them something. I'm available. Give me a call. 
I have other marketing ideas. We can talk contract. My number doesn't have to start with a nine. You can save that for your star player. <laughs> I'm out of work for cheap, okay? I don't need to start with a nine. Maybe an eight five, but not a nine. Okay, eight fifty. <laughs> Per hour? Man, that's not even legal. Nope. Um, let's let's play our other prediction game. Let's look at playing our weekly prediction game where we predict how the games are going to go this week. Matt is notoriously bad at this game. I think I beat you every year, and last year I beat you 6-1. to one. I, I think the highest amount of points I've ever had is like 3. So Yeah. So the, way, so the way this works, for those that don't listen, is every week we predict the games that are coming up. Then the next week, we will go back and review how we did. We get one point for every time we predicted correctly. And uh, usually, as you can tell, if we did 6-1 to one last year, we don't do very well. But Matt does especially terribly. Yeah. We've even had guests that have done better. Like, I think we've had, like, Mike on here, like, three times. And even he's doing better than you. Yeah. Uh, it is what it is. We've had Peter Marin once. If he would have predicted, he'd probably be doing better than you. Yeah, probably. It's um, not hard. So Matt, you know, like if you get it right even once, you're you're going to beat me. So, yeah. So, Matt, let's uh, talk about the games coming up this week. We have two games. The Flames have a week off. And then on the 16th, which is this coming Saturday, probably right after most people hear this, an 8 p.m. start as the Flames kick off their season at Edmonton. And then on uh, the following Monday, the 18th, the Flames have their home opener versus Anaheim, 7.30 start at the Dome. Interesting stat for you here. The Flames have not won a home opener since 09. And when they won, or sorry, a season opener since 09. And in that game, Brandon Prost was the guy who scored the game-winning goal to get a 5-3 win over the Vancouver Canucks. And that was also the last time the Flames, I do believe, won a home opener too. Because like it's, they, they've been pretty bad in home openers as well. So... I bet Brandon Pruss never thought he'd hold a Flames record. Yeah, for that long. I, I'm going to say that uh, for the first time in 12 years, the Flames will win the first game of their season. And that, okay, and how are they doing the second one? And they beat the Ducks too because they suck. <laughs> I'm going to go 2-0. Interesting. You're usually the opposite. You're usually a guy who you're either going all of them, and then the next week you'll say none of them. So yeah. I think we know that uh, after this, what is Detroit, Washington, New York, um, and New Jersey. So I guess we're going to have three and know, one. Three and one. You think so? Yeah. But anyhow. I think we're going to win against Anaheim, but I think Edmonton is going to want to uh, come out strong in their home opener, and I I don't know we're going to win that. So I'm going to say we win, Edmonton, we win Anaheim, lose Edmonton. Yeah. Uh. Again, as much as it pains me to say it, I think Edmonton's going to have our number this year. We've had Edmonton's number a lot lately, but I think I think this is going to be a year, honestly, when Edmonton's going to best us. How would you say? I think, and, you know, I might be wrong, but, you know, their efforts... They usually are. Not when it comes to Edmonton. I'm actually quite accurate when it comes to them. Because, you know... Uh, <laughs> Maybe you should be on their podcast. I'll work a trade if you want. No, no, thanks. Uh, I'll send you over there and I'll see if I can get some sort of uh, pick in next year's podcast or entry draft. Yeah, I, I like to cheer for good teams instead of, you know, whatever that is. Anyhow, um, I think the Oilers' efforts at, like, improving their depth are not really going to help their team. And I think that the goalies are going to be worse than they were last year. I would act, I think I, the goalies will be worse. I would. I think the defense will be better, though. Yeah, it's one of those things that. If McDavid or Drysdale get hurt at all, I could easily see them missing the playoffs outright. And you know, because they're literally a two-trick pony. And you know, I to me, I do not think that the Oilers are like even if they make the postseason, I think that they're it's going to be much like last year where they got swept or like they lost to Chicago. Like it's they're just not built the right way. And, you know, I, I see that this team, like, you can only ride two guys half the game for so long before things start to screw up on those players. I I don't know the Oilers are going to do really well, but I just think they, they might best the Flames this year. Yeah, I just, I don't see them being as good as any hype that they might have. 
No, and and to me, I don't see a lot of hype with them. But Mike Smith always seems to play well against the Flames for some reason. Yeah. Um, and and I think that their defense has been almost nothing the last couple of years. I don't think that's going to be super good, but I think with some sort of capable defending, which I think they can get, they. I don't want to say they're going to be number one, but I just think that. They've got two guys, like you said, who can go. And I think those guys could get them enough points early on that even if they get hurt, Edmonton could 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 still do well. Yeah. And I think Duncan Keith is going to bring some leadership they need. Yeah. I, I still think that like they're overrated a lot. I don't disagree, but I think if there's one team that I think could jump the sort of prediction in the in the Pacific, it's them. It's not going to be Vancouver. I don't think it's going to be any of the no. uh, any of the California teams, and it's not going to be Seattle. Seattle might be able to jump over Vancouver, but you're not going to see Seattle jump into second. You're not going to see San Jose do it. You're not going to see Anaheim do it. Like I just think Edmonton's the one team that could play spoiler that way. Yeah, they're the only team that could play spoiler. Yeah, I was about to say, like, this division's quite bad, so, yeah. Well, let's hope that... It's just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, like, I, I, I'm just still confounded by the Oilers because of the fact that, you know, having two of the best players in the league and they're still that bad. Like, it just, it's mystifying to me, but, yeah. You know. um, well, let's hope you're right, man. We win both the home opener and the season opener, and that'll be, I think that'll be monumental for the Flames if they can win both of those. Yeah, well, it would be nice for this team to actually start off the year hot for a change instead of, you know, like 500 hockey. Yeah, because usually, I mean, you and I are usually complaining about, you know, these guys not doing anything really until like Christmas. Yeah. And then they get hot and then like they that. fall apart at the uh, at the end of January. What are they called? The bye week in the past? Yeah. Yeah. I know, and I think like getting off to a hot start, I think, is imperative, especially with so many road games. I think you're probably right. Well, as a quick note here for everyone listening, um, we are going to be going on a regular schedule after this. I know we've had some changes to our schedule with some of the preseason stuff, but after this, we'll be recording Wednesday nights for pretty much the rest of the season. That might change once or twice, but the Flames don't play a Wednesday night game until January, so we figured that would be a good night to record, and I think they've only got four of them all year. So uh, we'll be moving to Wednesday night starting next week, so our next episode will be recording on the 20th of October. So as always, let us know what you want us to talk about. Give us any burning questions or hot takes you have on the Flames. You can get a hold of us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're fi- facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. On Instagram, we're Fireside Chat underscore podcast. We're not on TikTok yet because you don't want to see Matt or I dance, but uh, you can also get a hold of us on our website at Fireside. Speak for yourself, Dan. And- Speak for yourself. All right, we're putting you on the TikTok. <laughs> um <laughs> um, and then we'll, we'll have Matt do some sort of dance every time the Flames score a goal that we can post. And uh, and we're, you can get a hold of us on our website at firesidechat.ca where you can uh, send us a message through our website. We'll also have our texting line starting up again next week. I'm having some issues with the service, so if you want to text us, we'll have that going again next week, and we'll give out the number then. So we will talk to you guys all on Wednesday. That show will probably drop on Thursdays, probably uh probably about Thursday evening for the rest of the season. So Matt, do you want to take us out of here? Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.